How do we ensure that we have our ecosystem governed with you know, having 20 different cloud products? And to my knowledge, anyway, there's not an automated way to do that. We, we start talking about portfolio ROIs. Uh, we raise the number up a little higher. Financial Innovations Podcast, helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. Uh, I'm excited here to introduce to you Norm Brandel, who uh, has a lot of great topics to talk about uh, with us today, specifically around uh, optimizing your process to work for your uh, work with your technology, uh, some cloud versus non-cloud decisions, you know, ta- interesting tax credits that, you know, may uh, incentivize you to make 2024 a, uh, a productive year for yourself. Um, Norm, it's great to have you. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if you want to just uh, introduce yourself real quick and then we can, uh, you know, jump right into uh, the topics here today. Sure. I've spent uh, most of the last 20, 25 years working in a couple of the major banks pretty much always in a technology finance role. That's how I describe it. Sometimes these roles sit in technology. Sometimes they sit in finance, depending on uh, the bank uh, and the time of the year. I've also spent some time uh, uh, being a CFO for the Data Management and Governance Organization, which is, I think, a great topic for both of us to talk about. Uh, I've just gone back to uh, being a consultant. I have a company called Jaden Consulting. That's the little plug. Um, and I call it rent a tech CFO, which, as I think you'll see, there are some unusual and specific rules and practices around technology finance that, you know, the regular CFO who is um, in retail, for example, probably doesn't know. So I think that's kind of the reason why I'm here and uh, very happy to, and excited to talk about it. Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, the interesting things that, um, you know, we, we talked about the, you know, the other day that definitely want to, um, you know, bring to our audience here is just, you know, around processes, because, you know, way too often, I see companies, you know, buying technology for the sake of buying technology, or they hear the latest buzzwords of somebody told me I needed dashboards. So, you know, I go and I put dashboards in there. Um, you know, and there's uh, kind of this misconception where, you know, I worked with small companies, I've worked with, you know, large companies and small companies all say, oh, if only we had, you know, bigger budgets, uh, everything would work great. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily just a matter of having the money for things to work great. It's it's uh, important to have processes that that support it. Um, so maybe you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, kind of the importance of you know, getting your processes optimized before you even, you know, think of implementing or, or buying a technology. Yeah, I mean, I faced this problem uh, many, many, many times, uh, particularly in New York. It's a small world and your friend at X Bank just bought Y technology and is you know telling you how wonderful it is and they don't necessarily care about anything else, you got to have that too. And often what you'll see these days, particularly if, uh, particularly in ERP landscape, but in reporting as another example, you'll see all kinds of tools out there, not necessarily a sense of consolidation or organization structure. You know, usually what I say is it's really faster if you go slow. And so here's typically what happens, the, the vendor comes in, They've got data on their laptop. It is not in your data center. So boy, oh boy, this really looks pretty and the charts are all blazing and it's lightning fast. That's not what's gonna happen in your environment. You know, I don't I don't care where you are. It's gonna take time, particularly in the finance industry, to get behind those firewalls, to comply with all your compliance things, and you're immediately disappointed in the performance. So I always ask about, uh, um, what, what is the capacity of this thing, particularly with the Seattle companies there? I, I like picking on them because they're all the way on the coast and it isn't going to be, and you're closing the ledger and it's not going to work to your satisfaction. So uh, the other thing that happens typically when you do install these things, all of a sudden you find out that all of your processes really don't match precisely what the tool demands. So you, you, what I think is when we talk about buy versus build later, you, you uh, if you're going to buy something, don't think 
that it's a good idea to completely change it as soon as you install it in your environment. And I have many people talk to us about that. And then all of a sudden the implementation takes years and it costs a fortune. Uh, and without naming names, uh, with some of the banks, you, if you're going to buy, then you're saying I'm taking 80, 90 percent out of the box and installing it and living with what that tool demands. If you don't want to do that, there's a whole lot of other things you can do or you buy something simpler, an open source tool or don't. So don't do that. A, a lot of people, particularly in the front office, don't want to be controlled by process, but you almost have to have it. And I don't know what your experience is, Daniel. What I hear from my buddies is particularly in a cloud environment. What you see is there's such a, a proliferation of tools. They've grown so astronomically. People have lost the, the, the trend of what the, where the workload is going and who the users are. And if you don't have that basic information, who are your users? What are their personas? What requirements do they have? What sort of the basic building blocks of any technology rollout? It's not going to go well. So I, I, again, without naming names, I know many rollouts with brand name uh, technology that take years at the bigger institutions. So um, the other side of the coin is if you are a smaller company, in my view is I kind of want to have Office 365. I'll pick a brand name there only because it's fast. It's easy. You don't have to think too much about it. Don't spend time and money and energy uh, on trying to create another spreadsheet. You don't need to, whether you like Excel or not. Uh, you can do Google worksheets too. So in any event, there you go. That's, I'll try to stop for the moment. I, I, I just think thinking things through and doing a proof of concept inside your own environment and taking your time and making sure it works inside your existing platform is an awful better way to go, even though it may look like you're slowing things down. Yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points in uh, in what you just said over there where, you know, um, you know, some of my key takeaways from it that, you know, also kind of, uh, you know, I'll echo as well is, you know, it's like it's like buying a house, right? And you buy a house and then you say, you know what, I'm just going to gut all the bathrooms and the kitchen and, you know, maybe the bedrooms, you know, we can do an extension over here. And, you know, by the time you finish customizing this house to be exactly what you want, you know, you have the question of would it have just been made sense to knock it down and build uh, build a house on the land, uh, you know, or or uh, have a house constructed, uh, you know, with everything that I want. Um, you know, in a lot of companies, they make the mistake of, uh, you know, I want to buy, but I want to customize. And they go and they customize to try to get the technology to work for them. Whereas, you know, instead they could be, you know, let's optimize our process. Let's make sure that everything's streamlined and as simple as it can be. And then let's go and look for the technology platform that works the best for that rather than, you know, trying to, you know, customize uh, or over customize a platform and force it to be what you what you want it to be. Yeah. I, I mean, I have uh, I actually I think I can say this name out loud. Uh, Amazon has a huge bias against vendor products for a lot of the reasons we're talking about, right? They build everything, right? And I mean, even like a general ledger or accounts payable system, they just can't deal with it. They want to do it their way. And Lord knows they're pretty successful at it. Uh, and they will build an awful lot of stuff in-house. Uh, and they obviously have the workforce and the resources to get this stuff done. But they are quite happy doing that uh, and justifying the incremental investment and at least they'll know that whatever uh, homegrown tools they, they put together, it'll work. It'll work immediately. There are people know how to do this. They do it all the time. Uh, I'm not suggesting, I, I think that's rather unusual. And I sure don't think it makes much sense if um, I need a general ledger update that I'm gonna build my own general ledger. Very few companies could do what Amazon does. And you're probably better off you know, looking at Oracle, SAP, or any of the big companies, Microsoft. Um, and looking at their products and, and installing those. But adapt to what the product is telling you is, I guess, my message. And don't try to uh, suddenly think you know more about the technology than they do. Uh, you're you're going to waste a lot of time and money. And, and it's an excuse to streamline your procedures. Document, document, document. Uh, make sure you have process owners. Make sure it ties to your data model. Uh, and uh, sometimes a new tool will force you to do those things. And that's not bad. That's okay. 
uh, even though it seems like you're going slower. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And, you know, and, and I think it raises a good point of, you know, understanding, well, you know, what are your limitations and, you know, limitations, not necessarily, be, you know, meaning one particular thing, but, you know, you could have financial limitations of, well, I don't have Amazon money to go build my own uh, general ledger, so I won't, right? And, uh, you know, expertise of, you know, I don't have developers that are just going to go and start coding something for me. Um, but also understanding that uh, just because you buy a product that's out of the box doesn't mean that it's going to work out of the box and work exactly how you need it to work, you know, out of the box. And you get a lot of vendors that just show you like, hey, look, here are all the buzzwords, uh, buy this BI product and now you have dashboards. You know, no, you don't have dashboards because you bought the BI product. You have the dashboard because you bought the BI product and successfully connected it to the data systems that you needed to connect it to and get the data in the right, you know, format and structure and optimize so that, you know, that they run in a reasonable amount of time and, and all that, that there are a lot of, you know, things behind the scenes that maybe not, you know, not everybody's aware of. I mean, that's right. And, you know, here's the other thing too. If you are a multinational global company, I guarantee that typically there's, and it's a North American based, there is a bias to the users that sit in North America. And that's usually a terrible mistake because the environments are quite different uh, when you go to Asia, when you go to Europe. You, you need to link those people in too. Uh, and you need to account for the differences in language, in tax rules, in everything else, uh, general ledger structure, uh, because otherwise you'll, you'll never have a complete rollout. Right. So uh, I like the POC concept. Some of the vendors don't like it. But give me a live version of your code sitting in my data center and then we can have an intelligent conversation. Because if I'm just looking at you know, the vendor's laptop, we, we also, at least in the past, we would say, you know, we kind of don't want to. Forgive me. I don't want to talk to the salespeople. Can, can, you, can you get the engineers in here, too, particularly the ones that are sitting behind the scenes doing the real code? Because otherwise, you're going to get fluff sitting in between you and the answer, um, and that to me, that always wastes time. So, yeah, and 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 it's a question of what's realistic too, right? Because you know, a, a sales rep that just shows you a product, they're going to show you data coming from all sorts of systems that maybe you're not even allowed to have access to. You know, I I worked with a lot of companies where it's a huge struggle to connect an HR system and. So even even just for the purpose of doing payroll planning and, you know, it's a legitimate reason to have salary data and all that. And, and, and a huge fight is is put up over, you know, do you really need this data or not? You know, and a, a vendor comes in, shows you a dashboard that says, hey, here's your trended, you know, next 12 months of spend on, you know, salaries and benefit, benefits and bonuses and, you know, all, all sorts of, you know, fringe and all that. And you see that's great. But buying that product is not going to get you, you know, uh, dashboards on on payroll. It's it's going to get you a step closer. But if your HR department isn't going to allow you to have access to the payroll data, you are not getting those dashboards no matter how much money you spend on, on a product. It's actually one of my favorite topics, which I could probably spend the whole hour talking about. I mean, <laughs> getting run rate for labor, uh, it, which everyone would think is such a simple thing. It's just not. And uh, typically, certainly at the financial services companies, even with the huge spend on software and data centers and cloud, 70% of the spend is labor, full stop. So like, if you don't understand that, uh, what's the point? Like, wh why focus on the 30%? Let's come back over here where your labor is. And they're very, for good reasons, very hesitant to reveal that information at a granular enough level so you could do a proper model. So we have this conversation all the time. Uh, if I even say the phrase run rate, I can interpret that 10 different ways. What does that really mean? Um, and, you know, I will go into the details there, but it's an important concept. If you're a small company, you might say burn rate. It's the same idea. You have to understand that number really, really closely. Um, and I don't think uh, quite a few companies don't understand it. Um, don't understand the implications. The history of the last two years, I've never seen, I'm, I've been around the block a little bit. I have never seen anything like the last two years, where if you go back two years, we had 20 plus percent attrition. Never seen that before. And not just for a month or two, the entire year was 25% attrition. And when you do the math, 
that extrapolates out to half of the company turns over inside of 12 months. Guess what happened this year? Completely the opposite. We're seeing five or six percent attrition, four percent in some cases. I'm, I'm saying things generally, but I think it's true across the board. And oh boy, isn't that that's a really a different scenario. And uh, uh, if you're going to have a run race, you sort of know that you'll anticipate that uh, and you'll be able to get at some of the more important questions around spend. In any event, the tool is not going to solve those problems. <laughs> None of those problems. Um, and it is about the data model in that case and in many others, too, and about the process. Yeah. And, you know, th there are many advancements that, you know, that have happened over the last few years that has made it quicker, you know, quicker time to value of being able to spin up and, you know, uh, the whole, you know, do we go cloud? Do we, you know, stay on premise for, th for you know, for uh, our infrastructure, or our key processes, you know, how to go over there? And, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest value propositions that the cloud brings to us is that, you know, you could click a few buttons and have a, an environment provisioned for you rather than, you know, hey, let's spend four months pricing out servers and, then get them delivered and then we have to install them and then we have to get the software and, you know, and, and before you know it, you're seven, eight months into a project and, and you're just ready to begin versus I clicked a button and, you know, I have an environment provisioned uh, in, in 10 minutes over here. Um, you know, how have you seen the, um, you know, kind of the emergence of the cloud shift, um, you know, some of the, like the time to value on being able to, yeah, it's a great segue. Uh, you know, I, I also think about Agile in the same sense, because if I go back five years ago, Agile, what, what's Agile, right? Um, and now at least they talk Agile. Um, I, I think the reality is we're in hybrid situations most of the time. But in any event, when Cloud first started, the pitch they gave to the Norm Brandells of the world, it's faster, it's better quality, and it's cheaper. And I kind of said, gee, that's probably overselling. And in fact, I think it was overselling. Uh, I have yet to see comprehensive analysis, particularly in year one, that it's going to be a whole lot cheaper. It's just not. OK, there are other costs that come up. And in some cases, the way they present these expenses, particularly AWS, is super confusing and takes a long time to understand. And you really won't know what the cost is until they've been using it for a couple of months. What is very clear is it's faster. There's no doubt about that. And if you're interested in innovation, if you're in one of those industries where change matters, um, it's the way to go because everyone is developing and working in the cloud. So, and may not be for everybody. I, I, um, I personally like the multi-vendor strategy. That's a big debate inside the bigger places too. Don't necessarily, I mean, you've got Microsoft, you've got everybody's offering a cloud alternative. You can have uh, uh, private clouds also. I personally like those hybrid environments uh, simply uh, uh, to be smart, to, to, to make sure you're not having a single vendor dependency. Uh, the problem you're getting into now is the data, right? Where Particularly if you're transitioning uh, an existing non-cloud app and you're trying to put it into the cloud. A lot of times, where, where do you put the data and, and how long do you have to keep the history? And there's a lot of questions that come up there that slow down uh, uh, the transition. And uh, I talked to, uh, I actually couldn't believe they told me this. I talked to a pretty big financial planning company, um, greater than a billion dollars assets under management. And they run around telling their clients that they have nothing in the cloud. And I, I thought that quite telling. I mean, I had to sort of do one of those and stop myself, but they were very serious. Nothing in the cloud. It's all in their own data centers. It's all on-prem. And they make a point of making that a business development marketing thing, right? Because people are nervous about the security stuff that sits in the cloud. I think that's overdone myself. I don't, I haven't really seen evidence that suggests things are less safe sitting in a cloud environment. I mean, I'm going to trust AWS and Microsoft and Apple pretty much to be as careful as they possibly can be. Uh, Chase has been very public. I think I might have this number wrong. I think they get something like 50,000 attacks a day that they defend against that uh, defend routinely. So um, th there you go. There's the issue. So I think a lot of people are going with hybrid combo 
uh, installations where the data sits inside, perhaps, uh, or a version of the data sits inside, and you, you use the cloud app. Uh, you know, the challenge I've had, just went to talk to some of my other buddies who are on the engineering side, the challenge is that the proliferation of these applications that sit under the cloud, there are so many of them, and they pop up all the time, and they're so easy to install. They're losing track of workload, and they're losing track of how much they're spending on you know, application A versus application B. And they're losing track of maintenance things. So uh, Lord knows they're not doing what Norm Brandell would say is, gee, did you count the number of users that you have at the end of the month? And you make sure that people left and they're not getting, getting charged. So uh, that's, that's sort of another issue. And there's really no good tool that I'm aware of, I'm, maybe Daniel will build one, that looks across the horizontal spectrum of a cloud and say, gee, here's where your work workload is. Here's who's using what. Here's how much it's costing you. And, and uh, so that's kind of another problem. And, and finally, one last thing. This is probably not going to be too popular, but I believe it to be true. Uh, the idea that we're going to get to MVP. And it's okay to use Pareto's rule, which is, gee, if you're 80% of the way there, it's okay. And that's MVP. Boy, but maybe I'm being a little old fashioned. It depends on which application you apply that rule to. If you're rolling, you're rolling on something that's not revenue related and it's not critical, great. You go MVP, it's an internal reporting system, fine. But I think I have seen in the rollouts I have witnessed over the last couple of years as Agile has become more and more popular, I have seen lower quality uh, um, implementations where, where when I look at stuff, I know it's wrong like the second it comes out, including an awful lot of ERP systems because they don't view them as critical as perhaps a revenue-based system. So. You know, it, it is a mixed bag, I think. It, it is the way of the future, certainly if you're a fintech or a technology company or, or even a bank in certain parts of the bank, you have to be in the cloud. But I, I think people are saying, oh, let's think about this a little bit more before we go all out and put everything in the cloud. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's definitely a great point. And, you know, it's there's not a one size fits all as, as I've learned with, uh, you know, I probably worked with, 40 to 50 companies, uh, you know, at, at this point. And, you know, you just see even the same product being configured in, you know, 20, 30, 40 different ways. Right. And, um, you know, and it's important to understand, you know, a few different things is, you know, one is pricing, um, I think is a very big one of, of what you mentioned about, you know, some services can be very obscure how they price it. Um, you know, and, and, uh, probably the, the, the biggest example I give of that is, you know, you want to put a server in AWS, for example, or Azure, or, you know, you, you name it cloud provider, you know, you're, you're paying for the, the physical machine itself, but then you're also paying uh, a separate price for the data you're storing in there. And then you're paying a separate price for the bandwidth that transfers back and forth um, none of these are things that you can really accurately uh, size and measure in advance because what you start with is not going to be what you end with. So it becomes very hard to, you know, be able to say, all right, here's what this is going to cost versus, you know, you buy a server, that's the price <laughs> of, the, of the server. You put it in your data center, whatever the electricity is, you know, it's always going to be on. So it's always going to consume the same amount of electricity, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's there's less variability to to the pricing there. So you want to understand, um, you know, that that aspect of it. Um, and, you know, just related to what you're saying about, you know, do we get 80 percent of the functionality, this and that? I think um, the problem isn't that the percentage of what features and functionality you're getting is that a lot of companies before they decide to put the 80 percent in there aren't doing any kind of feasibility analysis on, you know, if I want to add the other 20% later on, how hard or easy is it going to do? And they go and they pick the easy features first because that's going to hit the timeline and, you know, stay on budget. So they, you know, look great to, to, to their superiors over there. Um, and they get the, you know, the easiest 80% of the functionality in the system first, only to find out that the other 20% can't be done in the application that they, that they bought. Um, and then it becomes, uh, do we live without this or, um, you know, do we have to switch to uh, to another vendor? 
Uh, I worked with a company, they just, they put in a single sign-on system and uh, they spent $3 million implementing a single sign-on system. And uh, it's a big financial institution. Um, and uh, they realized at the end of the project that after they implemented it, that every single security question that it asks you of, you know, what was the first school you went to or whatever for your password reset um, was all publicly accessible information that could be Googled on anybody. And so they then had to rip it out and put in another system and spend another $2 million putting in another system because, you know, did this get 80% of what they wanted to? Yes, but there was a gaping security hole in there that made it, you know, made it not feasible. Look, I mean, these these are these are some of the most critical questions I think uh, facing us today. As if you're in technology, because there was this rush to go to the cloud, and I think people are stepping back and thinking about it a little bit more. You know, many years ago, uh, I was a finance guy for uh, a huge compute grid at um, which is sort of the first step towards uh, cloud-like activities, and we kind of told our own infrastructure providers, listen, we don't want you to put anything in the box. Like, don't put any uh, overhead stuff. Don't even put labels on the bezel. Don't leave it alone. We don't care if the thing fails. We just need access to the compute part and a big network card. And this took an awful long time to get that agreement up front. And it, but on the other hand, it made a huge difference in cost because these were not database, it wasn't a database application. It, it, uh, data didn't matter. So a lot of those things still come into play. Uh, I hate the pricing when they put those little pieces together. If they bundle and tell you this is what the number is, which is what we did many years ago, um, I think that it creates a whole lot more transparency uh, uh, and you never really know. And if you ask a technologist, gee, do you want the little card or do you want the big card? Guess what they're going to say? I've never heard them. Oh, no, we can sell. I've never heard a technologist say that. And uh, so I kind of don't want to give them the choice, uh, standardize, put out something uh, um, that everyone understands. Here's what in it from the back. I'm not sure we're there yet, um, frankly, on, on uh, that kind of standardization across the board, which, again, goes back to my conversation around maintenance. I, I don't think we're there yet in really understanding from the back how to maintain a multi-platform kind of grid cloud environment. We're just not there yet. Uh, it, it, look, back in my younger days, we used to say, as a consultant, we used to say, look, you get to pick two out of the following three. Cheap, fast, good. You can't have all three. And and I, fan, I find that to still be true today. And I always vote personally because of who I am. I like good and I like cheap. So I'm willing to sacrifice the time element. It's just common sense. And I think what we've done today is we've gone fast, right? And we not necessarily cheap and not necessarily good, but we are fast. So, you know, for me, if I'm even if I'm building a spreadsheet, I'm going to stop and talk to some people because anyone can do a pivot table and bang something out and show it to folks or use Tableau or any other other tools that I'm sure you're more familiar with, you You can generate something really, really quick. Does it tell you anything? Does, is there a story there? Is that, how is it related to the data? That part gets skipped over an awful lot. Uh, and I, I think it's a mistake. And I think people get caught with it. Um, look at some of the other banks and some of the issues uh, they've had to go across the board. There's stuff that's happened that should not have happened at some of our major financial institutions. And I, I gotta believe that's about data management and governance and moving too quickly. So it's probably a little off topic, but that's what I think. No, I mean, uh, it's funny because every time I talk to you and, you know, we have a talk track, uh, a million things pop up in my head. Of, oh, it'd be great to get your your opinion on this and that. And, and I know, uh, you know, we don't have uh, eight hours to go and, and do a deep dive in, the, in the, on this uh, session here. But, um, you know, I, I think that Something that often gets lost when thinking of cloud, non-cloud is, you know, what is the total cost of ownership? I think it's much easier in the on-prem world to really calculate what something costs. You know, from a number of server standpoint of what you need, you can calculate the technical piece, you know, very easily. But then, you know, a lot of products get bundled together where, you know, you have companies that say, you know what? 
Um, maybe I don't like all the features that just pick a, a vendor name out of the hat, Oracle or SAP or this one or that one has, but the fact that I could just pay one price and get, you know, uh, a, an HCM application and an EPM application and an ERP and a BI tool and this and that, you know, is something that I'm going to go with. Uh, you know, I can go and find people that are kind of cross-trained across multiple tools to actually support this. And now we're going best of breed for everything. And, you know, that means that I've got to find uh, the IT person that knows Salesforce and uh, Oracle EPM and Tableau and, uh, you know, this particular ETL tool and that database and this. And, you know, when you start looking at all the permutations that start existing of, you know, how do I support something like this, it becomes, you know, very expensive to uh, when you start adding up all of these costs. So, you know, I, I guess like uh, I know you've worked in environments that, you know, weren't as price conscious in the sense of, you know, we'll, we'll buy every product that's out there because we, we need it or whatever. But, you know, like how do you kind of look at, um, you know, is it is it right to buy this technology? Do I have the support for it in place? Like, like what are the things that you're thinking of when when you go and say, hey, let's let's go and bring this, this new piece of technology. Yeah, super difficult question these days. Um, it, it's unfortunately, I think it's less about the math and, and more about uh, the business case, uh, particularly for the front office folks, uh, who's supporting it, what's their reason. It is a high level conversation these days uh, because it is so complicated to do proper TCO. And, and I usually stick up my hand when someone says they did TCO or they did, uh, here's my other favorite one, they did an ROI analysis. I mean, these phrases are constantly misused. And uh, you know, to do a proper ROI is no easy thing to do with a cloud-based application. I, I start out with saying, what's your base case? Okay, do you understand? Because if you're gonna do ROI or you can do benefit cost analysis or whatever other fancier thing you wanna do, you gotta have your baseline done. And often they can't at the application level. It's it, and and you know it's not that they're not trying. Um, certainly the banks and many of these they don't have one or two applications. They have thousands of applications, and they are unique to their businesses. When you think about the banks, that gee, it's an investment bank. Well, let me tell you something. There's no such thing as an investment bank. There are 20 significantly different products sitting inside that umbrella, and not all of them are going to need a whole lot of tech, right? An investment banker probably just needs Bloomberg and email, whereas the trading side of it needs a whole bunch of other stuff. So I think people have walked back from using that terminology, uh, and, and it's become let's do a higher level, faster, easier thing to understand, and who in the front office is asking for it? What are the pros and the cons? A little bit more qualitatively, uh, I, I'm, you know, look, uh, the, the finance guy gets into an awful lot of trouble if the finance guy sticks their nose in, well, gee, can I have this? Thing? You know, it's too slow. And I actually can't disagree with that at all. It is too slow. Um, and any numbers I would come up with in those scenarios are speculative, right? They're not gonna be locked down general ledger kind of numbers. So we, we do try to look at the actuals. Uh, we do take uh, uh, everything they say about headcount with a grain of salt also, because typically if they need five, they ask for 10. Uh, so it's, 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 um, it's a best get, I, perhaps this is controversial too. At the moment, I think it's a best guess situation and and uh certainly for the larger applications we will be doing background analysis on this and try to compare it to what the base case is but um you know we we spent a great deal of time talking about application portfolio rationalization that was a hot button too because particularly with with banks or any other company has grown through acquisition they inherit a whole bunch of little things that they don't necessarily know anything about uh, or we've acquired a smaller company. They don't particularly want to sit behind our firewall. They want their own email. They want their own this, that, and the other thing. Uh, I remember if people come over from other banks or other companies and they say, gee, at Goldman, we had this. And so needless to say, 
I'm not going to sit there and say, gee, you can't have that because it doesn't fit. Our, you know, obviously, we're going to do whatever we can to make them comfortable. So it becomes it's becoming increasingly more complicated. I think budgeting, same thing. I mean, it, it is not back in the day, which is not that long ago, say five years ago, we did project based budgets. And the word project has sort of disappeared from our lexicon, right? We, we don't really think about projects anymore. We, we, we think about uh, outcome-based products. You know, the language has completely changed. And speed has become the thing and innovation and time to market. That's become more important. And, you know, again, I'm not Jamie Diamond or any of the other uh, senior guys. It's their call to decide how to run these things. Uh, remember, at the top of the house, the banks certainly can control spend simply by controlling the incentive compensation pools. I mean, they have this monstrous lever, so they can't keep spending flat year over year. Um, and, uh, you know, in the case of uh, 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 Jamie, Jamie Diamond and J.P. Morgan, they said, hey, we're going to have an international bank. It's going to be technology based. Well, you can imagine what that's costing, right? And I think it's a good decision. Don't get me wrong. But uh, uh, that is not technology specific. That is a business decision. Uh, very difficult to grow assets when you're JP Morgan because of the limitations on the, on the regulatory side. So, and every bank is facing these hurdles. Citibank's going the other way. They're just jettisoning you know, whole uh, sections of bank because they're just not profitable at the top of the house, not at the micro level where I was sort of used to operating. So it, it's another complicated question, which I don't, I don't think we have good answers for yet. Well, I think one, one thing that I'm kind of, you know, gathering even just from our conversation here is that, you know, it's, there's a lot of emphasis that people are trying to put on what's the ROI instead of like for a specific number. Right. And it's, if the ROI is, you know, a 10% increase in this versus a 9% versus an 8%, like, there is no rule of a, it's got to be greater than this per se to go and do it. So it's less about what the ROI is. You wouldn't be asking for the technology if it wasn't going to make, you know, bring some kind of benefit to the group. It's more around, do you have a plan around how you're going to support it, how you're going to implement it, how you're going to make sure that it's governed properly, you know, with, with, you know, many of the other topics that we've talked about is do you have all the right, you know, processes and infrastructure in place where this will be successful if you buy it rather than it's a 9% increase in efficiency versus 10%. That, that's right. I mean, it's totally, they, look, we used to have quite formal business case processes. They still do. Uh, where any kind of incremental investment spend, it would be a small amount, 250K perhaps, you'd have to have a document we call the business case, which talked about pros and cons and objectives and all that kind of stuff. You know, it still happens, but it is not it is not driven by the numbers, I would say. They are high level numbers. Uh, they're done offline. They're not necessarily empirically derived. And, and it, you, know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Go back to cheap, fast and good, right? If you want to move quickly and meet market demands, it's tough for to sit back and say, Norm said, gee, I really need like a month or two to do uh, an ROI, which, by the way, would be fast. Um, it's not happening, right? So they will take vendor numbers, assign them at a high level to our cost and say, this is what it feels like, right? I, I, I'll tell you another funny story is I work for a CIO, super smart guy. And uh, this is when Linux was being rolled out. And that was, you know, at the time, oh, we're going to save all kinds of money because it's free, right? Um, and we had a technologist presenting what his cost benefit ratios were going to be and ROI and all that kind of stuff. And needless to say, they're extraordinarily high. And uh, God bless the guy I was working for at the time. He looked him right in the eye. He said, you know, that's a really great presentation. You really appreciate it. How many people do I get to fire tomorrow when you implement this? You know, and he, he sort of went back, but I took the point. He's you're not actually going to save money unless there's less people working on it. Uh, and so who are those people or, or what tools are we getting rid of? Like very, very seldom do you get to that level of detail when these things are rolled out. Uh, it mostly after the fact until they, and, and look, guess what? 
when you have real information as opposed to hypothetical information, it's not a horrible thing. If your ledger structure is set up correctly and you can isolate the spend, you're going to know. You're just going to know about it later and at a higher level. So it, it's just a fact of life. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely uh, good information. And, you know, th this is why, too, that, you know, I've been with the show, been trying to get people of, you know, all different backgrounds from a, you know, what types of jobs they worked in, what industries, what level, what, you know, because um, it just brings a lot of different insight, you know, into, uh, into your, and I think, you know, you raise a lot of great points. I, I, I think one of, um, you know, the, the big light bulbs that went off in my, in my head as we were talking here, you know, when you, when we were talking about governance and, you know, uh, buying all these different products, whether cloud on-prem, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about having the ROI of, you know, getting what you, you know, want from a business value. That's definitely highly important. But how do we ensure that, um, you know, the update process, the, you know, the data we're pushing to it, the metadata we're pushing it, how do we ensure that we have um, our ecosystem governed with, you know, having 20 different cloud products in, you know, I mean, I think that's the question of the day, really. Um, uh, I, I think other than pulling a whole bunch of spreadsheets and having a bunch of people working uh, long hours, there, there's not, to my knowledge anyway, there's not an automated way to do that. We, we start talking about portfolio ROIs. Uh, we raise the number up a little higher, look at the total revenues as opposed to necessarily, you know, bringing it down lower, uh, looking at the major products and defining what those products are. And I don't think that's a bad answer, frankly, um, because that does allow speed um, and, and the world is becoming faster, faster, faster. So, you know, challenge is um, uh, everyone wants to talk about product as sort of a new structure, but the ledger don't work that way. Sorry. And I, I've had that argument many, many times uh, with people that have come from other places that say, well, I have a product now. And you're getting in the way. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's a bank. It's not a candy store. Like in a bank, we have to actually have a structure and it can't be made up. And it's got to be consistent with the way the overall structure of our businesses are. So, I, you know, that's that goes back. That takes months to sort of resolve. And who's going to sit in a cost center? You know, all this sort of silly stuff that people take for granted, but in fact, drives the, the, the overall numbers. How do I allocate that out to my businesses? I mean, we, we can spend a whole hour talking about allocation methodology um, and how do you get to actual true product numbers? Because meanwhile, we're ignoring all the other stuff that sits on the side that is a part of the total spend. So uh, forget about taxes or any of that other stuff. Uh, so <clears throat> look, I, I think it's logical that what's happening now. I just think um, certainly for the people I know who work in jobs like mine, you still have to have that backbone of the general ledger and structure and compliance. You have to have something, uh, you know, otherwise you're going to lose track and, and you're going to make mistakes in what you're investing in. As I said, I started saying before about application portfolio rationalization, like that was a buzzword for many, many years. And, you know, we were spending, but we kind of had data and like we're spending 300 K there's a, an app that costs us 300K. But in order to take it out, we'd have to spend 500K. And oh, by the way, we didn't really take it out because the data had to be kept somewhere. And if you moved it to the cloud, that, that was a whole nother problem, right? Where is the data? Going? Who's going to look at that? How do you make sure that the app still is going to be able to look back because it's, it's a regulated industry? You're going to have to have history. So uh, that, that stuff continues, I think, continues to happen. Uh, what, what I've seen is a flattening of the decision tree. That's the other good news. It's not vertical, as vertical as it used to be. It's very much like this. A uh, number of managers have been cut uh, dramatically all over. And, and that's because people want to move quickly to accommodate business decisions. But uh, it, there are a couple of tools out there that pretend to get to things like ROI and cost-benefit analysis. There's a whole bunch of tools around the DevOps space, which is a, a whole nother topic we could talk about, uh, which is an attempt to save money by combining 
uh, development engineers along with the infrastructure side. And there are some tools that get at uh, those expenses, but I would not call that total cost of ownership uh, by definition, because they're only looking at the segment that sits in the infrastructure space. So anyway, we, we like I say, we could probably easily go on and on and on just on that topic. No, I mean, you know, definitely a lot of great points in there. A lot of things to uh, to consider. You know, I know, um, you know, one thing we were talking a little bit about before the show was just, you know, in some of the changes to some of the tax credit regulations and, you know, understanding that, you know, while we're not going to, you know, we're not, you know, CPAs giving tax advice or, or anything on, on the show, but, um, you know, definitely want to make the audience aware of, you know, like that this may be a good time, um, you know, or, or there may be some changes that, that go along the way. You know, we've had uh, a lot of changes with cloud versus non-cloud versus, you know, with can certain dollar amounts I spend be capitalized or not, right? And, and you know, that was a, a hot topic, you know, when the cloud came out of, you know, I don't want to go and buy a cloud product because I can't capitalize, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the infrastructure that, that I'm getting over there, right? So, you know, maybe um, if you want to just talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what we're seeing from a, you know, tax perspective now and, you know, kind of if there are any other, you know, considerations that you think, um, you know, may be important for, uh, for viewers to understand. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had that particular argument where someone says, gee, I'm going to save money, I'm going to capitalize it. And, you know, I kind of, I, I, I shudder when, when it's like, so okay, so when you use your credit card, are you saving money when you do that? Because that's what's happening with capitalization. And I've tried to use so many different analogies when it comes to that. There is a cost to capital when you capitalize something. I'm sorry. It's the nature of the rules here. So you're not saving any money. Uh, and think about it. What these uh, When you capitalize in software, it's an intangible. It's like a trademark. It's like a copyright. You can't sell it. You can't do anything with it. You can't leverage it. It doesn't help you in any way. All that happens, you know, what's happened in the last few years when interest rates were low, it was fine, right? Because the internal rate of return was so low. As interest rates start to creep up and they don't, not very public about this number, it's going to cost you money. So in any event, really sort of quickly at high level, right now, today, there still is a rule that says if you are doing internally developed software, not for sale, Internal, I'm building my own reporting system, I'm doing whatever, I must capitalize those costs, right? And just the direct expenses associated with them. That has not gone away. Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, poorly written, I, I'll say that. It's not well written and documented because it's not really meant for technologists. And that has been around for many, many years. And the balance sheets on many companies are pretty large because they've been doing this for all that time. On top of that, there is a separate thing that's also been around for a long time, which I think is a good thing. It's called the R&D tax credit and still exists today. Um, essentially, the, the, the short answer is it, you, will take, you are allowed to get a tax credit uh, equal to 25% of the direct expenditure uh, uh, you're doing for R&D. And the, the usual, the simple answer I say, well, gee, what's R&D? Because Lord knows you could spend a long time talking about that too. R&D is spending on something that you have a risk of failure. That is not, uh, it is something that you don't know what the outcome is going to be, and it may or may not succeed. Uh, so a tax credit, like on your personal tax return, that's kind of like a juicy thing, right? Because it's not lowering your spending, it's a credit against your tax amount. And it could easily be a very large amount. Well, so there, and all the big four companies have, spe pardon me, specialized people, engineers and accountants, sometimes the same person, just on this topic, because it is not the world's easiest thing to uh, um, get at. This year, they've added, in their infinite wisdom, another category. It's called Section 174. And now all of a sudden it's called research and experimentation. So wait, that kind of sounds like R&D, isn't it R&D? So yes, it is in fact, everything, it's 
in that last category, Section 174, does qualify for the tax credit, except you can, in, in that bucket, it's everything, except for land, except for depreciation, all the other overheads get mixed up. So you must capitalize those things too. And they have, I think, a very long life associated. You have to capitalize them over five years. And I sort of, you know, scratch my head and say, wait a second. So now you want to be agile. You want to be quick. You're going to roll this stuff out every five minutes. And yet you're telling them they have to have a, a life of, of five years. That sure doesn't make sense to me. I don't think any software built this these days lasts for five years. But the, the important one, I think, is to make sure, and I think most companies are aware of this, even the smaller ones could have a significant impact on their taxes for this R&D tax credit and this new section 174. And I'm, I'm sure if you ask your CFOs for, for in a lot of these companies, they'll probably go like that when you bring this up. But um, it, it's, it, it can be quite significant, a big, big number. And this new section 174 is brand new this year. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of confusion. And I probably just told you everything I know about it right now because I'm not a tax guy, but it's something to be aware of. Uh, uh, and every single technology spend, and since every company sort of does this in one way or the other, uh, even something like an integration, if I'm integrating two products that have never been integrated before, will count, and I've seen it count in the past, under this sort of bucket. And so that's kind of a good thing. And it goes right up against your taxes, right? Not as taxable expense. And please don't capitalize stuff that shouldn't be capitalized. That kind of makes me crazy, but it happens. It, it kind of happens all the time. Yeah, no, that that's great. So I know that we're coming up close to the end over here. So, you know, before we, uh, um, you know, wrap up over here to any other, you know, tips, tricks, lessons learned, anything that you, you think might be important, uh, you know, for our viewers to uh, to know before we end. I mean, I would say in summary, I, um, I, I think structure matters, right? And whether it's the general ledger, whether you're talking about programs and projects and now products, uh, that matters. And it cannot be done in a haphazard fashion. And I think that it's, people like me sitting behind the scenes go, gee, how am I gonna make sense of this? Because I need to make it work inside a regulatory environment or inside any other bank. You know, If you're a FinTech and you're a small company, fine, I get it. You don't have to be that structure. But if, if you're in some of these bigger companies, it is worth spending time thinking, what does my application portfolio look like? How does that relate to my product portfolio? How does that relate to the general ledger? And oh, by the way, there are multiple hierarchies which ERP systems have to deal with. Rationalizing those and make sense of them really makes your life a lot easier. And you won't get a lot of credit for them on day one. But when you're answering questions quickly in detail, uh, you you will get credit for it. And they'll they'll say, "Gee, how did you do that?" As they well, that's the last year I've been spending moving stuff around. So um, that, that's kind of how I believe it. This is a very complicated space because you do, I think, challenging because you have to be knowledgeable enough of the technology to have a conversation with technologists and explain things in a way that they're gonna, it's going to resonate with them. Um, so um, I, I still think it's plenty challenging and the cloud hasn't made it any easier. So thanks. Thanks very much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation myself. Yeah, no, I appreciate, you know, having you on and, you know, remember for everybody just because, you know, it may not be uh, regulatory required doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't do it. So, you know, it's always good <laughs> to have, you know, the the right processes and be able to answer those, you know, those questions. So, you know, appreciate you breaking down uh, all of this for us, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have you on uh, several more times in the future for uh, the treasure trove of uh, be my pleasure. information you have. No, uh, that's great. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Just a final question. Uh, you know, if anyone, uh, uh, any of our viewers want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, I think LinkedIn for the moment is the best way. Um, I have contact information on there and uh, um, I kind of live in LinkedIn for the moment. It's uh, um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody comes up with. So. 
Awesome. That's great. Well, you know, just uh, for anyone uh, watching over here, just make sure that, you know, you follow the show, like, uh, comment, tell us, you know, what you liked. Um, so that way that's going to drive, uh, you know, who we have on the show to, you know, bring more great guests like Norm on, on the show, um, you know, and, and address the topics that, you know, you care the most about. Because, you know, as, as you're aware, there are a million different uh, things that touch FP&A. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, addressing uh, the biggest need items for everybody.